Have you guys ever thought about how a scientist communicates with the public? Well, they don't. Because a scientist does not have a channel to communicate with the public, even if he or she has come up with some very exciting research. You see, their only route to communicating with the public is through the media. And the media is obviously, they're, they're not scientists, they're not researchers, they're laymen, right? And they don't know how to you know, work with data. So they often come up with quite exaggerated claims of the same research paper. In fact, I want to show you a media piece that came out a long time ago. And I want to show you how the media distorts what a research paper is like and what the uh, conclusions are of a research paper. And they come up and they say they make some exaggerated claims. But then later on, when the scientists communicate with the public, that part is left out because the only channel that scientists have to communicate with the public is through research papers. So take a look at this. Right. So in, I think this was seven years old. This was 2011, where a paper comes out that says antidepressant use in England source. Right. And it says that the prescription for antidepressants went up by 28 percent. Um, from 34 million in 2007 and 8 to 43.4 million in 2010-2011, right? So crazy claim. And then they say, you know, depression is costing the economy and this and that. And, you know, this is a an example of poor reporting, right? Or poor scientific reporting. Because later on, the scientists themselves, they came out and they said, this is wrong, right? And they put out the only way they could communicate to the public, like I've mentioned before, is through a research paper. So very recently, the BMJ, which is a place to find research papers where scientists communicate with the public and each other, um, they put out a research piece on exploring the reasons behind the recent increase in antidepressant prescribing in the United Kingdom. And their conclusion out of 189,000 people was that the rise in antidepressant prescribing in, is mainly explained by small changes in the proportion of patients receiving long-term treatment, right? So what exactly happened was that Earlier, the antidepressant prescriptions that were written were written for many months. Nowadays, or you know, in 2011, 2000, 2010, 2011, the antidepressants written were written for shorter periods of time. So more prescriptions were written when the patient had to go back to refill their prescription. In fact, doctors were being safer when they gave out prescriptions. So they, instead of giving out long-term prescriptions for one piece of paper, they'd give out, you know, every month they'd give out one prescription, which made it 10 pieces of paper. So it looked like a lot more people were getting prescriptions. And this is what, you know, this kind of uh, article put out that it misread the entire situation and it said, look, you know, the prescriptions uh, are rising and that means the antidepressant use in England is soaring. So understanding how to describe data is something that is super duper important, right? And, uh, and otherwise you'll just be subject to this, right? And you're just going to unnecessarily fear things. You're unnecessarily going to undervalue the f or, or not fear the things you need to fear. So what we're trying to do at Meta here is trying to teach you how to how to work, how to know that this exists and how to be a little more skeptical. So let's go to our episode today. Our episode today is called describing data, right? So there are two main ways to describe data. And some of you have already studied a little bit of this, but we'll recap it. The first one is qualitative, right? And the next one is quantitative. So in qualitative description, these are called frequency distributions, which basically mean a table of how often something occurs. So assume there are 10 people in a house and here are their genders, right? Male, male, female, male, female, female, male, male, female. And we, we meet them in this particular order. For, first we meet a male, then we meet another male, then we meet a female, then we meet a male and so on and so forth. So we've met them in a particular order. Qualitative data description basically means you collect all the people who are male, you collect all the people who are female, you put a frequency number on it. You just say, okay, six males, four females, Total is 10, the percentage, this is simple description, right? And then you can make a pie chart out of it, right? So you can get all of these, you can create free charts at metachart.com. Again, we have no affiliation with them. Our job is just to give you the tools that allow you to do all of this. If you're using Google Docs or Google Sheets, you can make charts too. So you don't have to use something like Metachart if you don't want to. Um, quantitative basically means you arrange data into equal length ranges. The length ranges must be equal with no overlap, right? So two conditions, equal length ranges, no overlap. So if you have the age of 102 people, 34, 67, 40, 72, 37, these are all ages of people, right? 
instead of you saying, oh, there are five people who are 33 here or six people who are 62 years old, you can make ranges because that's a better way to study this, right? So we make ranges, equal ranges, just 18 to 22, that's five, that's a range of five people, that's 18 to 22, that's 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. That's a range of five people, right? And you split the entire thing, which is you say that, okay, the least age is 18 and the most age is 72. So that will be our range, right? And you say 18 to 22, the frequency was six, right? And you do the entire thing, you total it up, it, the frequency comes up, the total frequency comes up to 102, and then you find out the percentage. And you guys know how to find out the percentage. And this is represented in adjacent touching bar graphs, right? And you can see it there and you can create this on meta chart too. Um, the next thing I want to kind of discuss with you is a population and sample distribution. So I'm showing you an example where the data with the most frequency is shown in the center. So for example, you know, you, in these age ranges, suppose you have an age range that has just two people, right? That would be on the lower ends, right? Whereas if you have somebody or, or a range with a lot of people belonging to it, say 50 people are between the age ranges of 50 to 60, that would show up in the center. So you arrange data like that, right? Where the center has the data with the highest amount of frequency. Then what you can see is that at a sample distribution of 100, which means if there are 100 people we've surveyed, we get this kind of form, right? This, you know, kind of bell curve form. And if you have, if you expand that and you go survey a lot more people and the sample distribution is 2000 people, you get the same form, but a more clearer picture, right? It's like a pixel, it's like, it's like a camera with a low resolution. If you use a camera with a two megapixel resolution, you'll get a very blurry picture. But if you use a camera with a very high resolution, say a hundred megapixel camera, it's the same picture of the same object that you're getting, except it's much clearer. You can see each individual pixel much, much better, right? So that's the difference between having, you know, a sample distribution and then the population distribution. So as we get bigger and bigger and bigger, and as we survey more and more and more people, then you start getting an actual clear picture of what something is like or what some situation is like. So a smaller sample size is like a blurry photograph of the population. Right. And as the sample size increases, the photograph becomes more clear. That's why we try to survey as many people as possible. It's like, think about this, right? Say you go out with a phone, right? Or a phone camera that has a thousand pixels and maybe it has a camera that can take or just, you know, capture a thousand pixels and you point it at your dog and you click on it right now. Obviously the dog is going to be representing those thousand pixels. Each pixel will have a color. And you know, if you zoom out, you can see the dog, right? You can be like, okay, I, I understand that this is a dog, but assume that you had another phone camera that had just five pixels, right? And you tried to click a picture of the same dog. What would happen? Most people with five pixels, you wouldn't even be able to be able to see what the dog is like, right? You wouldn't even be able to tell, Hey, that's a dog. Right. And a lot of people who conduct research studies today, they conduct research studies with like very, very small sample sizes with five people or 10 people. And that's not enough for you to make any clear inferences. It's not enough for you to say that's definitely a dog. You can say that might be a dog, but kind of looks like some animal. So you can't make perfect and accurate. Um, you can't, you can't make any assumptions from that data. Right. So we try to get a bigger sample size so we can get clearer photographs. And as you can see here, you can also represent this and this with the same curve, which is this, right? So it's called a bell curve. We learn more about bell curves, but you know, this is the point. The point is that you can, it can be represented like that. It can also be represented as a curve, right? So that's it for this video. I want to make it very clear that there's quantitative data description, there's qualitative data description. And then I wanted to show you how, if you get all the highest frequencies, some somehow in the center and you know, all the lower frequencies on the side, you get this bell curve um, that you can play with and we'll show you how to play with it in a future episode. Thanks for joining me on this one. This is me calling it a day.